Welcome back again to the Law Unscripted, where we talk about everything in the law and the legal system that you never knew. Never understood. And no one ever told you. I'm Virginia Tarani. And I'm Chelsea Rogers. And we are with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer. Till you do. Okay, everybody. Part two. Get right into it. Part two of the life cycle of a criminal case. The last one we did, part one, we hit um, basic traffic offenses mm-hmm. and misdemeanor offenses. Yes. We did two hypotheticals, um, both in a car, and those were, I think, fairly common hypotheticals. Yeah. So if you're an average citizen, the most likely encounter you're going to have with police officers. The traffic stop. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the traffic stop, the common traffic stop for a, a traffic ticket or something that is more of a misdemeanor, yeah. like driving on a suspended license, driving without insurance, reckless driving in Virginia. Um, so we went through what happens mm-hmm. when you're pulled over, what happens if you get just a regular ticket, what happens if you get this misdemeanor. Yeah. And today... We're up in the ante. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are going to the hypotheticals of felonies. Dun, dun, dun. Bigger, more serious consequences. Yes. Um, So these are the cases where we're going to go through a hypothetical, two hypotheticals. Two hypotheticals. We're going to go through the traffic stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going back to the traffic stop, but we're going to add an extra element or two. And then we're going to talk about what happens if you're not in a traffic stop, but you have a warrant. An arrest warrant. They come knocking at your door. That's bad news bears, guys. That's a bad one. (laughs) It is. So not very common, but interesting. Um, Not very common, I mean, for the average person who is a law-abiding citizen. Right. Um, But sometimes it does happen, Mm -hmm. um, even to people we consider in ourselves of law-abiding citizens. It's weird things that happen. Um, But it's interesting. So I think this will be an entertaining session. I think it'll be fun. I'm excited for this one, guys. (laughs) Especially since Chelsea's our hypo. I really like Troublemaker it. over here. Very big time criminal sitting by yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. So let's get back in the car um, with Chelsea. All right. We got some Taylor Swift. Let's turn it up, y'all. Maybe some Kelsey Ballerini's new album. We're jamming. We're All going. Right. Um, so I am speeding. You're speeding again. Again. Can't help it. Got a lead foot. (laughs) (laughs) So she's already been picked up for a regular speeding ticket Mm -hmm. in Maryland. Then she was picked up for a reckless driving in Virginia, where it was a full-fledged misdemeanor up to a year in jail. Yes, we walked you through that in part one. Now she's speeding again and get pulled over. All right. So we see the lights, we see the sirens, and I already know. I'm in trouble this time. (laughs) Here we go again. All, All right. right, put the car in park, hands on the wheel, because this is not going to be a good time for me. Yes, they're checking the car plates, mm-hmm. okay? They see her car plates, they're going to start running them, go to the driver's side door, start checking, start talking, insurance, registration, and license. Mm-hmm. You know, I open my glove compartment, and what else is in there? <laughs> and out pops a syringe. Whoops. There it goes. The police officer looks over and says, huh, what is that? Plain view. Plain view. There it is. It's already out there. There's not much that goes on with the syringe except some type of drugs. Right. Um, this is going to be a reason. This is going to be reasonable suspicion of evidence of other crimes in the vehicle. Which would be drugs. So they're going to be able to pull you out of the car. Yep. Um, put you beside the car so that you cannot reach into the car, tamper with any evidence, have access to it. You're probably going to ask me for consent to search my car, but I am a law student, so I'm not going to give consent. And they are going to do it anyways because they have probable cause. Because, yes, because now it's not even just reasonable suspicion. Now they have probable cause that there's evidence of drug activity yeah. in the car. A syringe is not a normal thing to have. Right. Um, and honestly, not in many households, unless Mm-mm. you're a diabetic, yeah. um, that's somewhat common and, but they're probably not going to ask you, maybe they do. Maybe they ask you if you're a diabetic No, or if they not. say, what is that? I think most people who have diabetes and have their kit with them say, oh, I'm a diabetic. Here's the rest of everything that's mm-hmm. just rolled out. But 
I'm not diabetic. Right. So a syringe falling out is usually evidence of a crime. Right. Of drug possession. So they've got plain view, even if you don't give consent. They've got plain view. They have probable cause. They're going to carefully take out the syringe Mm -hmm. and they are going to keep it for evidence and they are going to arrest you on suspicion and probable cause of possession of narcotics. Yes. So, I mean, we can talk about even if they see the needle, they'll probably bring the drug dogs to sniff around the car, right? Potentially, Mm -hmm. especially if there's one needle, like, is there something else? So that they can grab because it's plain view. Yes. But they can't search the rest of the car without your consent unless there's some other probable cause. Right. So let's say they bring the drug dog. Drug dog goes around your car, Mm -hmm. alerts on your trunk. Mm Mm-hmm. Now they have probable yes. cause to get into your trunk. <laughs> and we learn this in Crim Pro, a dog sniffing the outside of your car is not a search. It's not. By the law, which is wild to me, but it's not. It's not technically a search. But once they have an alert, that is probable cause now Yeah. to search your vehicle. So they open the trunk and what do they find? Um, they find... What kind of drugs do you do with needles? I don't know. <laughs> heroin. Okay, good. Heroin is usually what they do. Yes. Some kind of morphine, heroin type, um, which is usually classified as a Schedule 1 drug. Um, yes. In Virginia, it's a Schedule 1. So the heroin type is Schedule 1. Cocaine is found as a Schedule 2. But yeah. both of them are classified in Virginia, where I practice. They're classified as Class 5 felonies. Oh, yeah. This is... Big bad news. So I'm in handcuffs. I'm in back of the car. You are absolutely in handcuffs. This you is a bad time. You are absolutely in the back of the car. We've already picked up one needle. We get to the back of your car. We find a cash. <laughs> <laughs> so we find multiple needles. Oh, yeah. We find um, evidence of more heroin. Yeah. Um, so it's not just necessarily paraphernalia. Right. Which is what the needles are. Now we find the actual heroin. Yes. Okay. So the paraphernalia is the original charge. Mm -hmm. Now we have heroin with paraphernalia. We're confiscating that, taking it into evidence. Now you have possession of paraphernalia and possession of heroin. Yes, this is not a good day for me. It is not. You are not going to be leaving the scene. They are not just going to give you a summons. You are not going to be allowed to go. Your car will be towed into Mm -hmm. evidence. Um, The... Heroin, the paraphernalia will all be connected, collected, and you are going to jail. Oh, bad times over here. So. It is. Now, even in Maryland, yeah. you would you would likely go to jail. But here's where we get into funky jurisdictions. So based on what we talked about, um, in Maryland, this would be a misdemeanor, not a felony. It is. It is. <laughs> Which, I mean... You know, decriminalized drugs is my take, but it's the, a shocking difference. I mean, it's a shock. I think that's the part that's shocking to me is that in in our last episode we talked about how close in the DMV, you know, you are on the same road and you cross over state lines. And to think if I had been pulled over a mile down the road, in Maryland. I could be arrested for a misdemeanor versus a felony now. Correct. Now, in both cases, in this one, you're going to go to jail. Oh yeah, um, because it's drug possession of Schedule One narcotics. Um, but you're right. Just a little bit down the road, you cross over into Mar- Maryland, you could have been arrested for a misdemeanor. Right. So in Virginia, it's a Class 5 felony up to 10 years in jail. And marijuana... And marijuana. <laughs> talking too much about drugs. Maryland. In Maryland. <laughs> and Maryland... It's a misdemeanor up to four years in jail. So there's still jail time. There's still fairly significant jail time. Um, But it's not as much jail time, and it's classified as a misdemeanor. And that really matters sort of after when you're talking about collateral consequences of the difference of having a felony conviction versus a misdemeanor conviction and how that would continue to impact you years down the road. Absolutely. Night and day. Completely. No conviction is good, right? Right. But... Have you been convicted of a felony on a job application is much worse right. than have you been convicted of a misdemeanor. I mean, and also if you're um, sort of in college or using FAFSA, if, you know, sort of government loans or aid or whatever that is, you will lose it if you've been convicted of a felony, especially with drugs. Yeah. Um, 
So you probably won't be able to take the bar exam, become a lawyer, oh, yeah. doctors, not so much. So these are going to impact your schooling, your occupation. Absolutely. If it's a felony in Virginia, at least in most other states, if it's a felony, you lose your right to vote. Mm-hmm. Own so a firearm. Yeah. You can't possess a firearm because there are charges of possession of a firearm by a felon. Right? Yeah. You cannot have a firearm if you are convicted of a felony. Yeah. So there are all of these different things where you hate to say it like this, but there are some states where it's much better if you have heroin <laughs> than in other states. You yeah. have to check your rules. Each state is different. In Virginia, it's classified of if there's more than a year in jail, mm-hmm. it's a felony. If there's a year or less, it's a misdemeanor. But Which makes sense. That seems to be a very clear cut. But as mm-hmm. as we're talking about, you know, sort of a reckless driving in Virginia has the same weight as a heroin possession in Maryland, which is, I mean, I can't wrap my brain around that. Just yeah. the, the stark difference when you're in such close quarters, I feel like, in this area. But Absolutely. bad news for me, I was in Virginia. You're in Virginia. Um, so you so are off to jail, in I the go. paddy wagon. <laughs> You are going to jail and you are likely going to be held overnight. Okay. What happens next? Okay. So I'm in this jail cell. I am not having a good time. You aren't. You're crying again. Oh, of course. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) So you're crying. They pull you out. They wake you up in the morning. You are going before a judge to be arraigned. Okay. So I You're in a jail suit. Oh, super fun. Yeah, could be orange, could be green, could be striped. Oh, okay, love that for me. Mm-hmm. I don't really think orange is like my color, you know? Go to Virginia then. Okay. It's, you're in Virginia, it's more likely green. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at this arraignment, when I'm in front yes. of the judge, what happens for this when you have this serious felony charge, you've been arrested? What is Paraphernalia is an extra charge. Is it two yeah, felony charges? Yeah, paraphernalia, yes. Well, it depends. Sometimes, I got to check back on Virginia. Sorry, it's, I threw no, that at you. <laughs> don't be sorry because, you know, I prosecuted so that everybody knows. I prosecuted in Virginia yeah. um, for about five years. I was in Newport News and then Winchester. And one of the things that I did, I was on the Drugs, Guns, and Gangs Unit. Um, what, a hand, what a mouthful. I know. It gets, it's a little, almost a tongue teaser yeah. there. <laughs> Um, I did a lot. I did um, everything from serious violent crimes and murder down to traffic offenses, um, right. depending on where I was at what time. Um, but there there are differences for the paraphernalia. And I think there are sometimes, depending on what paraphernalia it was, you yeah. could drop it down to a misdemeanor. I can't remember right now if the needles are considered a felony paraphernalia. Either way, multiple charges, at least yeah, one felony. At least, at least two charges for paraphernalia and then the felony of the heroin. We're going to assume that it was not enough to kick you up into the Distribute. sale and distribution. That's a whole nother. <laughs> a whole nother level. So if you have too much, too much of drugs, if you have a certain amount of weight, um, then there's a presumption that it is manufacture, sale, or distribution of the drug. Um, And that gets you into a higher felony. Yeah, you can't just say, sorry, I was stocking up. You know, like I went just like Sam's Club and get the big box. That's not right. It's not going to work. Yeah. I'd love to see the argument in court, though. Sorry, Your Honor. (laughs) I I was possessing it, but like I was not distributing. And there are those arguments. It was a bulk sale. I don't know what to tell you. Absolutely. I I am so addicted. I needed to save up. Um, I use so much per day. This was only a five day stop. Yeah. I mean, there are those types of defenses. And I mean, you have to put on evidence for it. To support it. Are those types of defense defenses? But if you have guns in your car and money or scales or you know the yeah the certain types of distribution um, <laughs> materials, then it's more likely that it's yeah I got some twist ties and some baggies in yes. my car yeah so those are high sky. We have all the puppies today. We have today. puppies again as usual. Um, Willow has stuffed herself. Beside me, Charlie was on me, which was nice. He's now beside Chelsea. They love these blankets. Again, if you haven't seen us before, (laughs) we have pink, fluffy, fuzzy blankets. Not because we're young or ridiculous, but because they attract our dogs. They're so sweet. They get cozied in here. They love them. 
Okay. Meal for dogs. So yes, you so, don't have access to dogs in the jail cell. <laughs> traumatizing. Very. And the judge is going to tell you you have been charged. So with yeah, we're at these arraignment offenses. now. We are at arraignment. Who all is at arraignment? So obviously the judge, mm-hmm. the defendant, me. Yep. Um, that's all that has to be there. Really? Now, in your case, since you're in jail, yeah. most likely one of the jail officials will be there. Oh, like a, yes, right. Uh, they're, they're making sure There's going to be escape. somebody who lets you into the room where they're doing the arraignments, okay. um, or by video arraignments are very common right now. Are we going to have a prosecutor or a defense attorney? Prosecutor is usually going to be there, um, depending on your jurisdiction again, but usually the prosecutor is there. Um, hi, Sky, come on. This is the little silky terrier who is cold, so she is in her sweater. Um, so sweet. And yeah. We'll see. Get let them get settled. Let them get settled. Move on the microphone. You can mm. hear Sky rubbing up on the microphone here. Um, so the prosecutor is likely going to be there. The there should be a defense attorney, usually from okay. the public defender's office. And if it's not an attorney, it's going to be some kind of representative okay. from the public defender's office who, gotcha. if they, if you're arraigned and you do not have enough money for an attorney, you're given access to public defender. And there's usually someone from the public defender's office to take your name down, write your name down, write yeah. your court date down, and then be able to contact you if you're still in the jail cell because yeah. now you've been assigned or afterwards that they can write you a letter to say, come and see us. Okay, so we talked about it a little bit in uh, the last episode, but so in this arraignment, they're going to say these are the charges, mm-hmm. this is what you've been charged with. The Yeah, the the maximum, the jail time sentences. is sentences up to 10 years in jail. Here's the fine that it could be. How do you plead? How do you plead? I do have a question for you. I'm going to throw this mm-hmm. at you. What happens if you just plead guilty immediately? They will then set it... Um, for a sentencing, sentencing hearing. hearing. Okay. Um, but because it's a felony, they can't do it in the lower court. Okay. Um, it is extremely rare. That I was going to say, happens. I don't think people do that, but it, it it's so rare. Honestly, if it happens, the judge will usually say, I advise you to speak to an attorney first. Yeah. I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm going to have the public defender talk to you. Um, So I was going to say because they don't usually just accept it. No, I mean that they will almost force you to speak to an attorney. Um, I have never seen it actually accepted in all of my years, even of interning, of actually prosecuting, of defending. I also did four and a half to five years as a criminal defense attorney. Yeah. Then I've done traffic here and there. So it, like all of my years of criminal law, I think I've only seen it once. And then the one time that I did, it was, sir, I'm going to advise you before you enter this plea to speak to an attorney. I've yeah. got one right here. Um, we're going to pause. You're going to go speak to this attorney. Yeah. And then usually they call it back and say, I'm going to ask you again how you plead. Um, so it is possible. I'm so sorry. This guy is all up on this microphone. Um, we try to keep our audio very good, especially since yeah. we have the audio podcast and we try not to have too many extra sounds, but, um, sky is very needy today. Needy. Um, so apologies. No worries. You can interrupt my hearing anytime you'd like sky. <laughs> this arrangement There's a is dog on the other end. <laughs> yes. Wouldn't that make it better? You just go into have court dogs. And there's a dog. Yeah. I think everybody would be much happier. It, it might help. Um, okay. So I'm at my arraignment. They're not going to let me just plead guilty without really talking to anyone. So I'm going to say, enter a plea of not guilty. Mm-hmm. Then what? Am I escorted back to the jail? It. Yes, you are okay. usually still in the jail. Sometimes they'll bring you over again, depending. They're doing so many video arraignments yeah. right now. I don't know about other states, but in Maryland and Virginia, there are a lot of video arraignments where instead of bringing you to the courthouse, they just have a place in the jail that's set up where they bring you to that room. They cycle you through. Gotcha. You're advised by a video monitor. Okay. They could, though, put you all in the paddy wagon bring you over to the courthouse, 
you're put in the little holding cells on the sides of the courtroom, and then you're brought into the courthouse one at a time. Okay. That is also very common. Again, it depends who's what using the, setup the is what the and... setup is. A, a lot of courts in other jurisdictions are not using the video Zooms, the, right. the Zooms for the the arraignment. So if that doesn't happen, you're brought down to, to the courthouse, you're brought in one at a time, you're arraigned in the courthouse. Okay. That's where you're more, more likely to actually have all of the defense Everybody attorneys there. available, ready to go to meet with you in the back. You're brought back. Um, you're not immediately released, even if you get bond. Right. So yeah. So that's the other thing. So, so for something like that, you know, maybe they're going to set the bond or yes. set the bail amount, whatever that is, or say, yeah, I'm not going to set one, you know, for our like super serious crimes, like our, our serial killers or whatever, right? Like you're not going to set a bail Absolutely. amount for them. And so they're just going to be back in jail waiting trial, right? Usually. And some states have the ability to refuse bond. Right. Depending on the, the offense. Let's say it's a murder offense. They can say we're we're refusing. Yeah, no. That this is such a great risk to the community um, that we are going to hold you. Oh, I think that's good. That, I know we touched on it a little bit, but those are the two factors, right? So when you're talking about whether or not or how much to be set in a in a bail or bond hearing, you're talking about are you going to flee? What is your flight risk? And yes. like, what is that calculus? If you've lived in the area for forever and you have a job and you're in school. What are your connections to what the community? What are your connections to the community versus if you're just sort of passing through, you know, I lived in Georgia and was just traveling through. That's a heightened flight risk, right? It is. And then the danger is the other side is that how big of a danger are you if we let you out, right? Yes. So the two factors for bond are flight flight risk and community risk. Mm -hmm. They are for the flight risk. They're checking your ties to the community. They're checking, do you have prior violations? Mm -hmm. Do you have prior failures to appear for court? Right. Do you not appear for court often? How many prior convictions do you have? Do you have any probation violations? Mm -hmm. Um, did you have an ankle monitor you took off? <laughs> um, how far away do you live? Are you in yeah. Georgia? Can we guarantee your appearance here? Do you, are you a student? Do you have no job? Right. Doesn't help if you have no job. Doesn't help if you have a regular address. They're going to weigh all of that. Then they're going to weigh the type of crime that it is yeah. as far as risk to community. Usually murders have either no bond or a high bond. There are some states that do not allow refusal of bond. Right. But they're going to set it so high. That it's prohibitive. It's very prohibitive of bond, except for very rich people. Right. Who sometimes still make it. Depends on your jurisdiction. Yes. So in your case, what will happen is usually at the time of the arraignment, you will also have a bond hearing. Right. So that they can determine now you've been advised of your rights. You've been advised of your your charges. Now we're going to find out if you stay in jail. So we're going to determine, we're going to pull up your record. We're going to see how many other crimes you have. Yeah. What your prior offenses have been, if any, did you violate any, any probation? And did the judge is kind of evaluating that, which I, yeah. I, sometimes I think about that. I think that would be a hard job. I mean, I guess they do it so routinely that maybe not, but when you are having people who've been charged with like very serious crimes with victims. That seems like a, a difficult calculus to me. The the more violent of a crime, the more victim crimes. Right. Those are usually the higher bonds. Right. Um, those are usually the secured bonds. Yeah. And by secured, what we mean is you have to put up a percentage of the money in mm -hmm. order to get out. So you have to secure your release, put put an investment yes. into your release. So you're given a $10,000 bond. Usually it's 10% that you have to pay yeah. to a, a bail bondsman. And you have to then come up with $1,000 to give to the bondsman. They're not going to let you have it back. But they're going to say, if you don't come back to court... You owe. you owe me the entire 10000 so cough up the 9000 Yeah. That's where we get the bounty hunters. Right. right. That's so <laughs> Just true. Just as an aside. That's so true. I didn't even think about that. That's very true. But so 
say they said it. At, I don't. I don't know what Virginia would set it at. Let's say I'm a, a first time t- offense, but I had heroin. I had paraphernalia in my car. Let's do ten thousand for you. Let's okay. do ten thousand secured. You're going to have to cough up a thousand. Right, and um, if I can't, you're going to be put on pretrial supervision. Okay, so the options are either pay the thousand dollars. And then you're on supervision with conditions that I'm assuming are drug testing, exactly. checking in, that type of thing. Or exactly. pretrial detention. You yes. just stay. You just stay. You can't cough up the thousand. Or even if you could, you don't want to be on pretrial detention. You don't want to be on pretrial supervision, which is very similar to probation. Mm-hmm. Um, just pretrial. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's say you bond out. Yes. You then have to come back to district court for a preliminary hearing. Okay. So what happens at a preliminary hearing and how long is it? So if I, you know, I'm arrested and I'm arraigned, that's pretty short time span. Yeah. That's very quick. You have to be arraigned very quickly. Mm -hmm. You can't just be sitting in jail without being advised of your rights. So you have a right to a trial. You have a right to a speedy trial. Um, You have a right to counsel. All of those have to be told to you very quickly. If it were Friday night, you might be out of luck. Yes. I know in Georgia that they have court like arraignments on Saturdays, but not Sundays. So, you know, if Saturday night, you get arrested. You're waiting until Monday. You're waiting. You just have to wait. In Virginia, most jurisdictions, if you get in trouble Friday night through Sunday, you have to wait until Monday when the court opens back up. So it's. That's just you're not a good time. You're serving time already. You are sitting in the jail cell until a judge can see you Monday, even if you get a low bond. Yeah. Even if they decide to release you on personal recognizance, but on or an unsecured bond. Yeah. So not necessarily personal recognizance, but an unsecured bond with pretrial supervision. Right. So now we give you a 10,000 unsecured bond, but it's pretrial supervision you're still doing the pretrial supervision. Yeah. If you don't show up, if you violate the, the probation, now you owe 10000 Right. Okay. So that's a very short period of time. That's quick. And then, you know, say the next day, you bond out. Mm-hmm. I paid my $1,000. I'm out. How long between then and usually a preliminary hearing date? Usually, at least yeah. in Virginia and Maryland, it's a couple months. Wow. It doesn't have to be. Check your state. Check your jurisdiction. It is even different yeah. from county to county. Yeah, just sort of court efficiencies and what they're being overloaded with. But it's not like a, a next week thing that's not happening. Not usually. And okay. Usually it's set out for at least a number of weeks, a number of months later. This is not a... It, no, it's not a year. Right. Okay, so it's it's within a fairly quick time frame. If it's a misdemeanor, the speedy trial starts to run. If it's a felony, it depends. Okay. It sometimes starts to run at arrest, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's reset at preliminary hearing. So you have to check. Okay. Um, But most of the time, speedy trial is still running. So you don't want to have the preliminary hearing too far out because your district court time is still counting for speedy trial overall, and then you have less time to bring the actual trial. Okay. So what happens at our, our preliminary hearing? They have to put on, they, the prosecution mm-hmm. has to put on enough evidence for probable cause that you committed the offenses you've been charged with. Okay. So in this case, <laughs> low standard, <laughs> um, I'm assuming the the plain sight needle that fell out of my glove box in our, in our hypo is going to be on that body cam, and it's as simple as that, right? They click for play. paraphernalia. Yes, um, that will click play. The off you don't even need a body cam, but it's helpful. Yeah, the officer testifies as to how he pulled you over that it was a legal stop um, on reasonable suspicion. Your needle fell out. That's paraphernalia. We ran the drug dog. We opened the trunk. Here's more needles. Here's what we think is is heroin. Mm-hmm. They introduce the drug report. And this is why you want, especially as a prosecutor, some time between the arrest and the preliminary hearing because you want that drug to be run at the lab so that you have the certificate to give the judge that says this is heroin. 
Okay. And that's good to know sort of behind the scenes what's mm-hmm. happening. So on the defense side, say you've you got an attorney. Mm-hmm. I have an attorney. What does that look like? But like what as a defense attorney are you preparing for in preparation for a preliminary hearing? Is it that okay, we know this officer is going to testify. I've seen one of these. It kind of looks like a mini trial, like a it very is. It's small, absolutely a mini trial. You have a trial. witness on the stand. You have direct and cross. It's a full trial. Right. It's just a different standard. So it is a full trial, but instead of beyond a reasonable doubt, which is for conviction, right. it is probable cause. So it's just a lower standard, but it is a full trial. And it's just with the judge there to make sure the state's meeting its burden. Yes. It is in front of a judge, not a jury. Mm -hmm. It is in front of the judge. The prosecutor has to meet the burden of probable cause that you've committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. As a prosecutor, generally, it is best if you can produce less evidence, just enough evidence to meet the standard to get to probable cause. Interesting. Because that way, your defense attorney doesn't have the ability to cross examine all of your witnesses. You don't have to produce yeah. all of your witnesses. Um, you produce just enough witnesses and evidence to meet probable cause, okay. especially in a victim crime. Right. This is where we get into gangs, victims. You yeah. don't want to re-traumatize people. You try to, if you have to put your victim on because they're the only witnesses, yeah. you try to limit their testimony yeah. to very specific things rather than entire testimony. Right. Or if there's somebody else who can testify to it, you try to put them on instead of your victim. So you're not re-traumatizing your victim and you're saving their testimony. Okay. And this would be like also if you had an informant or something like that, you're not going to. Oh, God. Right. But that's a whole different. If I can try not to burn my informant at preliminary hearing, I mean, save them for beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. But yeah, the, once you get into confidential informants, yeah. I'm moving out of district court and I'm going to try to put them in a grand jury, secret grand jury, where once the arrest is made, you're in front of circuit court. And not district court. Sorry. Excuse me, guys. No, you're totally fine. Um, okay. So this is my question. So that's sort of what the state's doing, getting the, the analysis on the drugs. Yeah. And the defense attorney is probably going to meet with their client in those discussions. are going to be like, well, I don't want to know if you did it, but is there any, you know, what does that look like, that conversation? Especially with drugs, I feel like it's hard. Like if you're pulled over in your car. It's... It's hard. And sometimes yeah. it's, you know, did was there a friend in your car? Are you driving your mother's car? Are you right. driving somebody else's car? Did, right. did you have someone else in your car? These are the questions I'm asking. I, my car broke down. I borrowed a neighbor's car. I didn't know that yes. was in there. I really had no idea. This is right. a surprise to me, too. That's when the defense attorney considers putting on evidence at the preliminary hearing. That's what, yeah. That this is somebody else's car. Now, they're not going to use the defendant. They're going to do everything they can to prevent a defendant from testifying at preliminary hearing. Okay. You don't want to do that because everything that they say is an admission that they're going to use at your actual trial. But you could get the, you know, say in this case, the owner of the car to come say, yes, that is my car. Or you save it. You save it for the trial. Realize that the state is going to meet probable cause and you just kind of accept it. Yes. Okay. So the other option that defense has is to waive the preliminary hearing. And then a trial date is set? A, it is set for grand jury. Okay. Where a grand jury in the circuit court has to convene, has to review it, has to certify um, the probable cause, and then you have a felony indictment. Then you will go to circuit court for a day or your attorney for a day, depending okay. on the jurisdiction, to choose a trial date. Okay. By a judge or by a jury. Okay. So you have this, you're in district, you've been arrested, just whatever, you're in district court. That's where you're doing that preliminary probable cause hearing. Yes. Usually. Then they're going to say, all right, great. The judge said there was probable cause, but we're also going to have a grand jury in circuit court. Look at this. You, that's usually the way it goes. Um, Check your jurisdiction. I'm a broken record here. Check your jurisdiction. Okay. But usually it's, certified to the circuit court mm-hmm. um, probable cause is found found by a judge it's certified it it's almost a given it, it's put in front of a grand jury who does a felony indictment 
Gotcha. Um, for it. So I would then have to write an indictment as a prosecutor. I would write an indictment, which would go to the grand jury who also does it, but without a trial, it's, it's just a hearing. They certify it. And then, um, the felony is officially in circuit court. Okay. I do have a question. I don't know the answer to this. I know the defense does not do anything at a grand jury, obviously, but in a case like this, where it's, it's, this person has been arrested. Now we're at the grand jury point. Can the defense attend that hearing? No. I didn't think so. No, but the only people who can attend a grand jury hearing are the jurors, a judge, mm-hmm. the prosecutor, and the witnesses. Okay. I mean, I assumed, but that would be interesting. A little. Yeah, defense is not allowed in these. Um, they are considered secret proceedings. Yeah. And secret means without the defense. Right. Um, sometimes the grand juries are called outside of the and just regular indictments from district court to circuit court where there are grand jury investigations, yes. um, which are much more exciting to talk about. Yeah. Where they're doing the investigations because the prosecutor is looking for a full scale, you know, here's the evidence that I'm tracking. Usually drug rings, drug cartels, yeah. um, gangs that they're investigating, larger RICO kind of crimes. It's yeah. a lot of federal grand juries. There are a lot of state grand juries, though, who deal with the investigative grand juries rather than just the indictment type of grand jury. Okay. Okay, I like it. So after that, now we are completely in circuit court. Mm-hmm. And we are just sort of pending a trial. Yes. So at this point, had I not been able to bond out, I would have been being detained. You're I would have there. been in jail this entire time. Mm-hmm. Pre-trial detention is wild. Okay, so now we have done our hearings. We don't have anything else except the trial, right? Right? Maybe not. This is Virginia. I am butting in because we have decided to split this podcast up a little bit because we're finding that there's just so much to say. Watch this series in order or pick and choose which stages of a criminal case that you're interested in because we're dealing with the life cycle of a criminal case from arrest to trial. Last week's podcast, number one in the series, dealt with traffic citations and jailable misdemeanors. This week, what you've just listened to is us going through Chelsea's hypothetical of a traffic stop with a felony stop and arrest. And we've taken her through preliminary hearing. Next week, join us, pick us up again for part three of this series from arrest to trial when we talk about circuit court or whatever the highest court is in your jurisdiction where they hear felony trials. We're going to take you through a bench or jury trial, um, see how that turns out. So stay tuned. Hit like, subscribe, or follow, or all three, so that you can make sure to catch next week's episode, part three in this series, and so that others can too. We're really excited about this series. We hope you had a good time today with this podcast and join us for next week. I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm with Tarani Law LLC, because you never need a lawyer till you do.